Hello and a very warm welcome to Canterbury Cathedral. My name is Emma Pennington and I'm one of the canons here at the cathedral. And today we've come to this beautiful All Saints Chapel and I am wearing the Canterbury Cope. Now on this cope shows the six most famous Canterbury Saints. And that's what we're going to be looking at over the next few weeks. The six of these people, who they were, what inspired them, what differences did they make to the church in England, and why are they so special to hear? Today we're looking at perhaps our most famous of the Canterbury Saints, which is Thomas Becket. And we're looking at him today because it is a very important day for him, the 7th of July. For on this day in 1220, his remains were brought from his crypt tomb up into the glorious shrine of Canterbury Cathedral in the Trinity Chapel. And there it attracted more and more and more pilgrims from throughout Europe who came here looking for hope, looking for healing, and knowing that somehow God could change their lives for the better. So who is this St Thomas Becket? We all think we know him. And he's depicted on our cope in probably the most traditional terms with his mitre for being Archbishop of Canterbury, with his robes of office, and of course with his sword, the emblem of his martyrdom. Thomas Beckett's story is surrounded by one of violence, disagreement, friends falling out, and it's often hard to think about this place as being a place of such violence, such blood, and such distress. But out of that awful moment, out of that breakdown in relationships that led to murder, something rather strange and wonderful happened to this place at Canterbury. Something that brought people here. They were seeking something, seeking God. And the bravery and the courage of Thomas Beckett to stand up for what he believed was right really echoes down the ages. So let's have a closer look at his story and try and find the holy man behind all the politics and behind the sadness and violence of his death. We come down to this part of the cathedral which is very significant for the story of Thomas Becket. We're on the north side of the cathedral which is often seen as the darker, colder side. Just over there is a door into the cloisters and over here in the corner is what is known as the Lady Martyrdom Chapel. But it's here that saw a great act of violence and a great place of fear. Because it was in this part of the cathedral that in 1170, on the 29th of December, Becket came down here because there was banging going on in the doors. We know the story, or we're not sure we know the story. We have a mythology around Becket. Uh, which tells about how he was the best friend of Henry II and then later fell out when he had great power. And then it's said that, um, you know, that, that four, four knights overheard the king say of his former friend and confidant, who will get rid of this troublesome priest? We don't, we don't know that Henry actually said that, but what we do know is the consequences of that night on the 29th of December. Because four knights did come down here 
they bashed on the doors. Beckett let them come into the cathedral and it was here that he was violently murdered. It's quite sweet sometimes how school children will come looking on the floor to see if they can find the patch of blood that's still there. And I suppose that's the way that we've tried to sanitize this story. But if we try and use our imaginations of what it might have really have been like, then it takes us to quite a place of unsettling and of fear. Behind me, we have this wonderful sculpture, which I think tries to capture actually something of what it might have been like that night. If you can see, it is actually two swords that are hanging down. They're really sharp swords, but they cast a shadow behind them to give us the four swords of the four knights. What I love about this sculpture is that it has tried to capture something of the violence of this place, something of the suffering of Beckett, but also that that suffering is actually can be transformed through Christ and Christ's cross, so that a place of fear and violence is not purposeless, but actually is seen in a greater story, and that's the story of Christ's giving of himself on the cross. We know that sadly today throughout the world there is still violence against Christians, those who try to stand up for their faith. And often we can try and dissociate ourselves from that. But I think what this space does to us, what this space here in the cathedral reminds us is that yes there is violence in the world and yes church people and those who are of faith are brutally, brutally um, attacked and often killed. But it's actually here in a very safe space that we can think about also the darkness within our own hearts and the place of fear and the place of violence within ourselves that this space helps us to just look at tenderly and gently and hold before the cross of Christ. We wanted to think a little bit about what were the motivations of Beckett. He was obviously a very ambitious young man. He rose very quickly, friend of the king, archbishop, chancellor, very powerful person. And then suddenly all that seemed to change when he became archbishop and was in charge of the spiritual um, heart of the nation, but also a lot of property and a lot of responsibility for the clergy. So what were the motivations? Well, I think for someone like Beckett, there must have always been so mixed. He must have had a conscience. He must have wondered what was his youth all about. He must have wondered why was God putting him in this place as Archbishop? Was he here to do a certain role? Was he here to serve the King? Or was he here to serve God? A deep conflict within him, a violence within him. And T.S. Eliot, in his wonderful play, Murder in the Cathedral, he tries to imagine what might have been going on for Beckett in those hours before um, he actually was martyred here in the cathedral. And he imagines that he is tempted, that tempters come to him and whisper in his ear about what he could be, how he could use his role to have more power and ambition, and also how he could use the Christian faith to get more kudos and be a martyr. And in the play, he grapples with this. And I'd like to read to you, this is the final speech that Thomas gives. It's right at the end of um, the first part of the play. 
And this is when Beckett has been tempted. And this is his final overcoming of that temptation. Thomas says, Now is my way clear. Now is the meaning plain. Temptation shall not come in this kind again. The last temptation in the, is the greatest treason to do the right deed for the wrong reason. The natural vigour in the venial sin is the way in which our lives begin. Thirty years ago, I searched all the ways that led to pleasure, advancement and praise, delight in sense, in learning and in thought, music and philosophy, curiosity, the purple bullfinch in the lilac tree, the tilt yard skill, the strategy of chess, love in the garden, singing to the instrument, were all things equally desirable. Ambition comes when early force is spent and when we find no longer all things possible. Ambition comes behind and unobservable. Sin grows with doing good. When I imposed the king's law in England and waged war with him against Toulouse, I beat the barons at their own game. I could then despise the men who thought me most contemptible, the raw nobility whose manners matched their fingernails. While I ate out of the king's dish to become servant of God was never my wish. Servant of God has chance of greater sin and sorrow than the man who serves a king. For those who serve the greater cause may make the cause serve them. Still doing right and striving with political men may make that cause political not by what they do but by what they are. I know what yet remains to show you of my history will seem to most of you at best futility, senseless self-slaughter of a lunatic, arrogant passion of a fanatic. I know that history at all times draws the strangest consequence from remotest cause. But for every evil, every sacrilege, crime, wrong, Oppression and the axis edge, indifference, exploitation, you and you and you must all be punished. So must you. I shall no longer act or suffer to the sword's end. Now my good angel, whom God appoints to be my guardian, hover over the sword's points. After Becket was slain here, his loyal monks took him down through this door into the crypt and it was there that his body was laid to rest. But it was there too that strange stories started to escalate and people started coming to Canterbury. In the early 13th century, there was a fire at this end of the cathedral, which gave the monks at the time an opportunity to redesign this whole upper area of the cathedral. And so they created the magnificent Trinity Chapel. Now stories had been circulating about miracles and strange happenings that had been taken down at the crypt where Beckett's body lay. There were stories of people being healed, of people receiving what's known as Beckett's water, which was water with a drop of his blood in it, and then them being physically healed of their ailments. The stories gathered and grew momentum and more and more and more people started coming to the cathedral, looking for that hope of being healed and being made whole through the sacrifice of Beckett's life. 
So they also brought with them their offerings, their pilgrim offerings. And it was with that money that the monks here could redevelop this area. And on this day in 1220, Beckett's remains were translated, as it was known, from his very simple tomb in the crypt up to here in the Trinity Chapel to a most magnificent shrine. You need to imagine that actually in this empty space that we have here today, there would have been raised quite high a, a large casket that would have had sides and a, like a pointy roof. And then around the bottom, there would be small niches where pilgrims could come and kneel and touch the tomb of Becket. And it was there that they would, would travel for miles to come to see and hopefully to be healed. Now if you come into the cathedral at the West End and you walk all the way through the length of the cathedral, you'll feel, feel a gravitational pull up to this site. And that's not by chance because the architecture up here is actually pointed towards this shrine. So you feel you go on and up on and up until you come to the very heart of the cathedral at the medieval period with this tomb to Beckett. Hundreds of people came on pilgrimage. Cantor became one of the top places to go on pilgrimage to. Of course the greatest place for a pilgrim to go was Jerusalem but with the Crusades and lots of violence across Europe Jerusalem is becoming more and more a dangerous place to go to. So instead, you could come here. I really love this part of the cathedral, not just because of the grandeur of it. I mean, it is quite an amazing view, I have to say. But it's because of what the monks did in the decoration of this area. All around here are in the windows show the stories of pilgrims who came looking for healing and for hope. We know that their ordinary names like Ralph and John and the sisters of Boxall, we know of individual ordinary people who came looking for God to do something extraordinary in their lives. And they're monumentalized here to remind the pilgrims of actually that their prayers were answered and that they then came back and gave thanks to God. Sadly, in 1538, with the dissolution of the monasteries, including Canterbury, the shrine was dismantled and all the wealth and the jewels that were on the shrine were taken away to London and taken to the king's coffers, basically. And then what happened was that everything was erased. Anything to do with Beckett was erased. You can find in prayer books of the time, around 30, uh, 1538, Beckett's name actually scratched out. And it was said that his bones were taken out of the casket, ground into dust and sent to the four winds. And then from that day, pilgrimage was outlawed. And so that was the case for many years. And if you were found wandering on the roads, you would be seen as a vagrant and put into prison. But increasingly, in the last century, half century or so, pilgrimage has started reviving. People now daily come here to Canterbury in very similar reasons as their medieval ancestors did, looking for something searching for something. Often we don't have those who are physically sick or with great ailments, but there's another sickness, mental sickness, a yearning for reason, for, for, for understanding, for what makes the world tick, for why am I here? Bigger questions that cause people to go on the pilgrimage road. And here, once again, Beckett is revealing to people that there is a purpose, there is something greater 
than illness and all that circumscribes our lives. There's something greater than death, and that is the love of God in Jesus Christ our Lord. And so the courage of that man down in the Trinity, down in the, by the, the martyrdom chapel, the courage of that man to actually be able to stand up what was right and gave the ultimate price of his life, bears fruit here in the Trinity Chapel as many come and find healing and wholeness, even today. So I'd like to end with the collect for today, the translation of Thomas of Canterbury. O God, by whose favour we celebrate the translation of blessed Thomas, your martyr bishop, regard, we beseech you, his merits and prayers, and bring us from ill to good, and from our prison house to your kingdom. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Thank you very much for listening and do join us next time on our journey through the Canterbury Saints.